afternoon everyone i am dr ashish tagar and uh, i will be discussing on topic of dural tears in endoscopic spine surgery and it will be it will be an interactive case presentation so i will li like to dedicate this presentation to uh, director professor dr ramesh kumar he was my guide and we lost him during the second covid wave so i would like to dedicate my presentation to him so starting with the case a 20 year old male presented with complaints of pain in back and pain radiating to bilateral lower limb more on the right side pain was mainly distributed in the l5 dermatome and it was associated with some sensory symptoms also sensory loss also on uh, going through the mri it was planned to go for endoscopic discectomy interlaminar approach so here i i would like to pose a question what are the what are the pre operative risk factor that you consider when you are going for this uh, uh, endoscopic surgeries what are the risk factor do you consider in pre operative phase either in the patient profile or during the, in the investigations in which you think there are when you are doing uh, going for surgery there are increased chances of dural tear so i would like uh, anyone from the audience can comment on this or from Ashish, the can we move on to the case i mean i'm sure yes. there will be a lot of interesting discussion over that so, uh, so your case which had a dural tear yeah uh so their preoperative risk factors mainly are the older age female gender comorbidity degenerative lysthesis revision surgeries facetal uh, cyst calcified lesions and epidural injections so during surgery uh, everything was going fine until a leash of epidural blood vessels i encountered and uh, there was yes. and uh, the whole uh, surgical field was filled with filled with blood and when the dust has settled i was left with a dural tear which you can see on the video in the right side so uh, what are the, what are the main culprits when you uh, we are going for such type of situations so the main culprit is blood visual field mainly from epidural bleeding or from the cancellous bone use of power burst reamers or fine and manual burst that we use in the endoscopic spine surgery can cause one of the uh, most toxic uh, uh, combination is use of burr in interlaminar approach mainly for lumbar canal stenosis curettes can also cause then synovial cyst in uh, most of the studies in some of the studies the incidence can be as high as 37.5% uh, again carison uh, rongers mainly when we are doing laminectomy on the uh, inferior lamina on the ipsilateral side or the contralateral lamina or while we are doing uh, phlebectomy of the deep layer of ligamentum phlegm in the particularly in the midline because as we know uh, in the midline there is spiking of uh, dura and uh, just beneath the deep layer of the ligamentum phlegm which can be injured when we are doing this so at uh, once the injury has occurred so what we do now should we proceed for the surgery or tackle the dura first so the literature says it should uh, the prime we should uh, continue with the complete uh, uh, primary uh, to complete the primary surgic, surgical goals but during that time we have to reduce the pressure of the irrigation pump uh, so that uh, because the there is direct connection to the uh, uh, the increase in pressure can directly transmit to the intracranial structures if we are using any additives in the uh, irrigation fluid you have to remove that like antibiotics or adrenaline and try to expand the surgical field so that you are able to see the dural tear clearly so uh, uh, because we are using uh, minimal invasive endoscopic spine surgeries it is said uh, that sometimes we can leave the uh, leave the uh, dural tear alone so when i went through the literature there was no standard, uh, standardized treatment guidelines but it said small tears can be left alone but what do you mean by small tears some literature said that it is it, it tear should be small enough so that we prevent the it prevent the rootlet from extruding out uh, one paper they have quantified it uh, it as a tear which is uh, less than 4 mm and without any herniation of the root in these such type of cases we can uh, simply observe or uh, and and we just give uh, bed rest for around 24 to 48 hours so we can determine the size by using the known uh, tools which are available so if the the tear is more than 4 mm the, what are the options which are available to us so there are muscle uh, or fascia graft that we can take there Uh, fibrin glue fibrin based glue which are i i don't think which are much effective in uh, endoscopic surgeries because of the flow of the fluid then the fibrin sealant patch such as taco seal is very helpful in such type of situations duragen patch which is available is also helpful and gel forms and surgery seal can be used so this is what i did for this uh, this thing i used a patch of taco seal and uh, covered it with gel form and put it 
uh, over the uh, uh, over the dural tear which was there. Tacosil, it is a fibrin-based hemostatic agent which is mainly used by our liver transplant surgeons. Uh, it, 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 is, it has quite sticky ends, it can, and it sticks even in the uh, fluid medium. Uh, so it easily sticks to the margins of the dural, uh, dural tear. And so uh, one layer is uh, placed over the dural tear and then a second layer is placed over it to cover it. And we ca you can put, if the space is there, there to cover the dead space, you can, uh, another, uh, you can add in another, another layer of uh, gel foam over it. So here you can see it is the second layer of taco seal with gel foam. And because the, in the, it was in the midline, so there were dead space and I put uh, further gel foam over it. We can use uh, uh, ball tape hook probes to manipulate the taco seal and place it on the uh, edge and edge of the dual tier. So I am adding another layer of taco seal with gel foam just to cover the dead space. And this is the last, last bit of the gel foam that I have placed there. Uh, so uh, if the gel tacosyl is not available, paraspinal mu uh, muscle or fascia, we can take it and cut it into the pieces, piece of uh, size uh, of the dural tear and we can use fibrin sealant glue. Uh, then the closure is, uh, closure, it should be a continuous clo closure of, uh, with, uh, and I usually do not, do not prefer drain if uh, there is du dural tear. If the tear is, more than one centimeter of, or if there is a flap of the dura, uh, then the only option which is left is uh, we have to repair it. We can either go for uh, convert the surgery to open, or there are some suture techniques which I, I could find in uh, in literature. It can be done using uh, uniportal or biportal also. Or best is to go for uh, to convert it into open surgery. So uh, Shin et al. describe a suture technique which can be uh, done using uniportal scopy also. But I have no experience in this. Uh, biportal uh, endoscopy provides much more freedom in repairing this because of the triangulation, the, uh, triangulation and uh, freedom of uh, movement of the hands. Uh, but, uh, some of the literature they have uh, shown that during biportal surgery we can use non-penetrating vascular clips which are available and these can be used. Uh, to summarize, if there is intraoperative dural tear, if it is less than 4 mm, we can just observe. If it is between 4 to 1 centimeter, we can use fibrin sealant patch technique that we, I just shows. If the tear is more than 1 centimeter, uh, you can uh, either convert it to open surgery or you can use one of the techniques which is, av which is available to, for suturing, but suturing is of that such type of tears is must. So that's all from my side.